Hello and welcome to the show. My name's Relevant. This is Do All The Things. And on today's episode, starting uh, to do something a little bit different here, I'm going to be building a DOD 250 pedal, some overdrive. Because with the amps that I play, I sometimes need a good overdrive. Will it be a good one? Stay tuned and find out. If you've been following the comedy, you might be well aware that I am in possession of a JCM 800, a Marshall 800, the famous. And if you're familiar with this amp, it needs overdrive, especially the way I play it. Some might debate that I just don't know how to play. And you know what? You might be right. Others might debate you're doing it wrong. You know, you gotta crank it up. Well, I believe that is subject to taste. And my personal taste, I overdrive that front end and then I can play it at any volume. That was half circumstantial because I've never been in the position to crank up an amp reasonably. So I am somewhat dependent with this amp on overdrives. And as it stands, for the past while, I've been using one of two overdrives. You know, I've uh, teetered back and forth between the Boss Turbo Overdrive and the DoD Mjolmsteen pedal. The Mjolmsteen pedal is gutted right now because I've been doing experiments with op amps where I did a mod, I put a socket on there so I can change the op amp on it. That's when I discovered, well, hell, different op amps have different sounds. Let's take this ball and run with it. Part of the purpose of this project is to make a pedal where I can easily change out the op amps without having to gut the whole thing. And then I can hear the different tones. And in fact, I have a whole bunch, a variety of op amps on order as we speak. And uh, in the future, I'm gonna be posting follow-up videos, trying out these different op amps and seeing the differences in tone they give us. I think it's gonna be really interesting. Well, at least interesting to me. The other pedal I've used is the Boss Turbo Overdrive, and it works. But the problem is, neither one of these pedals were perfect. The Mjolmsteen pedal had a great mid-texture and the high end. Yeah, awesome. Low end, and uh, not so much. The amp didn't have quite enough if you know what I mean. The Turbo Overdrive, it had the low end I wanted, but the mids were kind of flat, and the high end had that solid, steady, kind of buzzy, fuzzy going on to it. This amp sounded more solid, steady than this one. This one sounds more natural. So I'm not too happy with the, the Turbo Overdrive, and for that reason, I don't use it that often. I've been focusing more on this guy, and its tone has improved simply because, well, I've been experimenting with op amps, and I also did this mod right here, that little ceramic capacitor. <gasps> ceramic? <gasps> you didn't put a ceramic in there. It's not a film capacitor. Yeah, I put a ceramic. It's, it's working. It works fine. See, in the DoD schematic, we have this feedback capacitor right here. This is the feedback loop that basically dictates how much gain that op amp's gonna push. If we ground out this loop, it suppresses the negative feedback and allows the full chooch gain to come through. But as we turn this up, it allows that negative feedback to flow and that suppresses the gain. This little uh, resistor capacitor network here, specifically this capacitor, is gonna have some influence on the frequency response. As you turn this down and ground it out, not only does it suppress the negative feedback, but it suppresses the negative feedback in specific frequencies. The idea is this will filter what frequencies get suppressed and it prevents a lot of extra low frequencies from presenting themselves so that your overdrive doesn't get all farty. Now, I feel like that's one of the reasons why I was lacking in low end here. And when I switched that to a point one, I was getting, I think, thicker, more low end right where I wanted it, but not so much that it became a problem. So I might have that problem a little bit nipped. So what I'm gonna do in the, in the clone is, well, I'm not 100% sure yet because there's a little bit of controversy there. You know, the original schematic calls for a 0.05. That might be some secret sauce that made the originals better than the reissues because the reissues use 0.047s. That is because it is a common value. They don't really make 0.5s anymore and they were hard to find. One of the few I could find was this guy, this big unit of a ceramic capacitor. Cost a whole dollar fifty. It's a lot of money for a ceramic capacitor. However, um, it kind of blew up in my face because the tolerance, uh, 80% to 20%, it's a Z-rated capacitor. That's that that's that's not that good. I imagine the tolerances of my old meter might be worse than the tolerances of the capacitor itself. But if I pop this capacitor in there, uh, four five four six, I might as well have gotten an 047. 
I might experiment with different values. I want to try an 056 and an 068 because I do want to warm this up a little bit, but we're counting our chickens before it hash because I have to find out what this thing sounds like first. Now the Mjalmsteen pedal is a kind of reissue. I don't know what other modern 250s would be like circuit wise, but I've looked over the circuit on this thing and I've compared it against this circuit and it's pretty much the same as that circuit. However, however, it uses a different kind of op amp. The original spec calls for an LM741 or maybe a TL081. This guy came stock with a 4558. It's also a dual op amp, whereas that's a single op amp. So it's not compatible. I can't just slap a 741 on here. Like people do that mod all the time, but you have to adjust on the pinout, which I don't want to do because this is a decent sounding pedal as is. I'm just going to clone it. But instead of making it so that I have to gut it, I'm going to put that socket right out front and center so that I can get at that chip just under the back cover. And I'm going to be able to hot swap these puppers and see what they sound like. Seeing here is the 741 that I've acquired. Very bog standard. An LM741 CNNOP. PB. I'm guessing CN means China, and I'm guessing NOPB means Ross compliant, no lead. Eh, I like a little bit of lead in my electronics that I do not intend to be disposable. There are other versions of this to consider, some of which I'm going to be trying. Digikey has the $23 LM741J in a ceramic package. I'd like to think J stands for probably Japanese. And if I was dedicated to the LM741, if I knew that was the chip I was going to run in here, yeah, I'd, I'd spend $23 and get that one just to say that I bought a more expensive chip for it. I have a hard time spending $23 on this with the understanding that it might not even be the chip I settle on. But there is a knockoff version of the LM741 clocking in at a whole 60 cents. Even cheaper than this one, the CN was a buck 30. We have the UA741 CP, made by the same company. Apparently, it's supposed to be another company's variation of the 741. And at 60 cents, it's almost price identical to the 4558. Like the 4558 is a cheap op amp and I can see why companies would choose it over others when they're trying to, you know, trim that bottom line. But if we can get a 741 for the same price, well, why not? But either way, those I will, I will be getting one of those so we can see how that sounds. Other components we're using, we have our bog standard $12 Hammond special here, just big enough to fit a nine volt battery this way. Yeah, just big enough in general. I got yellow, so it's kind of true to the aesthetic also. And then the pots, the pots are real interesting. Look at these guys right here. Look at these guys. These are TT Electronic P0925Ns. The rest of these just denote uh, like shaft length, shaft type, and the value. The circuit calls for a reverse audio taper. Not a normal audio taper, a reverse audio taper. In the big picture of your adjustment and time scale, a linear pot just goes like this as you turn it up. An audio pot goes something like this. A reverse audio pot's gonna go something like this. And a reverse audio pot is kind of rarer. In fact, I feel like I was lucky to find one in the size format that I wanted. Now, P09 is the series, 2 is the number of gangs. Ideally, you'd want a P0915N, but the C500K, C is what they call the reverse audio taper, was only available in the 2 gang, and that's fine. It was less than a dollar more, so not exactly breaking the bank. The important modifier here is 5N. In the P09 series, they have a whole bunch of different formats. The 5N is the one with the horn sticking out the butt so that it will mount on the board face up. That way we can do that hack where once this thing's installed on there, we'll be able to support the board via the pots. We won't need uh, other standoffs or mounting methods to support this board. Now, mind you, there were certain inconsistencies in that they didn't have the exact same pot. The 100K I got actually has a longer shaft, so I'm gonna have to cut that down. For resistance, I'm just gonna be using your common, you know, what are these, quarter watt? Quarter watt carbon film, not carbon comp. I like metal film usually, but we're gonna try to keep it somewhat vintage. Carbon film will do. I think these are my last two diodes of the 1N4148 variety. Gonna have to reorder some of those. For capacitors, I got these old NTEs that I bought years ago, they're 10%, but they, they're more in line of what might've been on here. Uh, they would have used metallized polyester film. If you get uh, ones in the voltage ratings that you actually want, they're, they're those kinds, like the little green dealies. These 
fit a little bit better. So I think I'm gonna use these guys. Random 120p. Nothing special for the can caps, nor do I think they should be. The 10U is freaking tiny. 10U 25 volts, <laughs> and then a 4.7U and a 50 volts. All these have way higher voltage ratings, like this is a 630 in the 001 and a 400 in the 01. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the voltage isn't gonna affect their tone or performance in any way. Let's, uh, let's check the tolerances on these real quick. Yeah, that, that's actually pretty good. What about this guy? 0.01. Yeah, okay, we're gonna be good. Oh, look at this. 4.7 is more like a 5. I wish our tolerances drifted like that for the ceramic. Mm, 9.2 for the 10U. But I digress. Now I've gone ahead and put together a layout. It has an aesthetic flaw, but it's a good layout, I think. And there it is. It's a tight little layout. Uh, these symbols here are resistors standing up. You'll see what I mean when I build it. The 0.5 unit was hard to fit on there. And in fact, it's going to be too tall to fit under the box. So it's actually gonna fold over, which is one of the reasons why I allowed this resistor to uh, attach underneath of it. This guy is kind of gonna be legs over here. So having big capacitors d was a challenge. Here we have a little jumper. Oh yeah, I pulled this off an old computer motherboard. This is going to allow me to disable the diode clipping so we can hear what just the op amp sounds like. You could debatably use the pedal as a clean boost or really just, just hear how much that op amp itself is distorting because that's, that's one of the things here. The op amps themselves will distort a bit. For our power jack, I got these chasis mounted dealies, which are subject to controversy because they're not going to be the correct ones that you want to use. I have a special AC adapter in my inventory that's center positive, which is opposing your typical boss hookup. So it this will accommodate it, but we're going to have to wire around that. All right, so we don't need to worry about this yet. What we need to do is start cutting things. I need to trim this pot shaft down and these, uh, you know, bog standard hobby freaking perf board, I'm actually going to be cutting it in half because this layout is only going to use half of this board. I've never actually cut one of these before, so I'm hoping I can just kind of, you know, do one of these. And pop. Oh, nice. Nice. Little bit of overlap, but I kind of compensated. In my design, we do not use this very last row. That's gonna be good, bud. And then we have to trim this shaft. I've already kind of marked it so that it's the same spot. Oh, we're gonna to need to call in a consultant. Oh, well, I was hoping this was gonna be a clean job, bud, but oh no. Time to spray debris all over the shop. It's just me or does that damn thing magically have the ability to penetrate past my eyeball? Past my eyeball? I don't think it's that capable. Past my safety glasses because of course in order to line it up I have to look straight on. Huh, 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 huh. Well, I only have to do that once, so. How's it look? Oh, good, pretty much bang on. Nice. Let's go start the fun stuff actually soldering. Ho, 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 ho. Now, one flaw in my design is the volume is on this side and the gain is on this side. And you see, that might not seem like a big deal until you realize that I'm mounting the pots to the solder side of the board and all the components are going on this side. So we're looking at the board this way. Now imagine we mock it up against a conventional design. Well, that's gain, but we flip it over, oh, that's level. So on my pedal, it's going to be uh, level gain. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be backwards. And I thought about changing it, but it's just, it works so well like this, especially the topology of the circuit. In, gain, level, out. These guys are kind of backwards, really. And some other pedals, they do it that way normally. Gain, level, even some other DODs. So, heck, why not? Oh, oh wow, this board flexes in the vise. Oh yeah, those are hard mounted on there now. Dash good, huh? Dash good. So now we do most of our work. Uh, oh, wh where do we start here? Oh boy. Five down. One, two, three, four, five down. It's like a game of Lego now. Right smack center. This is gonna be so... Oh, how do I get this to stay into place here? Where's my claw? Here's my claw. So we're gonna pinch that on there. And certain positions we're not using, like this guy, that guy, and that guy. We're gonna go ahead and solder those down so it stays put. 
One of the bother's features of using a socket if you're less experienced with soldering is um, you're gonna be less likely to bone, blow out your IC. Too much heat on certain components can damage them. You know, it's funny. I think it was a very long time ago at Radio Shack, I bought a multi-pack of various resistors of this type. These are them. I bought these resistors when I was a child for big hopes of building something like this. Oh, now I'm finally doing it. I work on big circuits, amps a lot, but <laughs> to actually use these little guys, little op amp chips, like I envisioned as a kid. Oh boy. I almost wish I drew this backwards because I'm most working mostly on this side. I got this trick here where say I want to bend a lead around a point and I don't have the, the component in there yet. And also the component leads are going to be flimsy. I take this pin tool that I have and when I put the thing in the vise, it doesn't fall out. And then that pin tool has a significantly stronger shaft in which I can wrap the lead around and establish the layout that I want. I'm no expert on this. I only really started working on perf boards. So I'm kind of figuring this out as I go along. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to fashion these contacts in such a way that I can easily replace this uh, capacitor when I get different ones to try. So I've got the little guys wrapped in loops now. So I can pretty much just slip whatever capacitor I want in there and it'll hold on to them like pin contacts. And then I don't have to commit to bending this guy up because that's what happens sometimes with these guys. If you need to rework them, the way you're bending leads to form the traces. You're committed. You're not getting them back out again easily not without damaging them and then that component the way it's cut may only ever be good for that application i'm gonna be putting this guy in last so it's good that i found a way to get that ready or it's one of the things i'm putting in last anyway so I've gotten to the point here where I do believe I have my components all laid out. Not as uh, colorful as the diagram here. And some stuff did move a bit. Like I moved this 4.7K down just to make room for other capacitors I might want to put here. This guy is, where is this guy? This guy's like right here. Yeah, I forget I could get components a little bit tighter to the pot because they're not on this side of the board. But I've reached the point where in order to proceed further, I got to start attaching wires so that I know exactly how and where stuff is going to go. Now, you see this red line here that indicates, well, I had a hard time getting ground to go all the way around with this tight layout. Uh, that's going to be wire. I'm gonna tack some wires onto the back of the pots here and then join them right, right about here. And I have common labeled here, but I think I might be connecting it here. Like according to the schematic, we just have bomb, 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 three ground points, three common points. Uh, you know, when you're building amps and this thing is like the first stage, you're sometimes very fussy on how the ground points work, but I have some seen some layouts that kind of just literally link these together in the same fashion that I have there, but connect generally in the middle. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. Either way, I gotta get some wires on here. Whew, these ground buses have to converge on this one spot right there. Oh, oh, I blocked my output. Kind of. Mm, I maybe made that a bit tight right there. It'll be okay. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna put my output put wire in next just to make sure. What's gonna be output here? Uh, white or yellow is one of the appropriates. What do I have more of? Yellow will be output. Okay, should be good. Now's when stuff starts to get tangled. We gotta establish the ground bus in the center core here. All right, come on. Okay. I think I got it. It's a big glob of solder on there, but I now have a ground bus, sir. Watch this layout it totally sucks and this thing oscillates. <laughs> Knock on wood. Um, how do I cut these down now? They're so far in there. I don't think my snipper's gonna reach. Look at that chip on and off of there. Might not be as easy as I thought. It's gonna be a tight fit with these components on the bottom here. <sighs> okay, getting there. Input, output, positive, common. So like literally one left. Signal in will be white. Oh yeah, bud. I think I got it. You know, black and red, self-explanatory. White's gonna be input. Yellow's gonna be output. I all seem to have a bias for this direction. That's fine. You know, it's just a case of fitting this big capacitor now, which was gonna go like this. Grab it here and go just like that. And then only that way is it gonna fit inside this circuit. Okay, Mr. Big Cap is in, and you see how I've arranged it. It should fit now like this. Key term should. Now I think we gotta start getting this box ready. 